IDC Radio. Ben, 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 106.2 FM. Radio IDC Radio, in collaboration with Kol Israel. Welcome to IDC International Radio. You're listening to 106.2 on the FM dial. This is the Counterterrorism Roundtable. On the eve of the World Summit on Counterterrorism, that would be the ICT's 14th annual international conference here in Herzliya, Israel, at the Interdisciplinary Center Herzliya. We have a whole host of important issues to discuss. I'm sitting here today with two distinguished members of the International Institute for Counterterrorism's scholar staff. First of all, let me introduce Dr. Eli Carmon, a senior researcher at the ICT, an expert on counterterrorism, recognized internationally for his scholarship, as well as Dr. Daphna Richman Barak, who is the head of the ICT's International Law Desk. We're going to be speaking today about terrorism and counterterrorism. Let's begin, uh, Eli and Daphna. The 50, arguably 51-day operation uh, of Protective Edge is over. There is a major debate in Israel and around the world about, from a terror and counterterrorism perspective, how did Israel do? How do you assess um, Israel's performance on the battlefield, Eli? Hello, Dan. Um, I think that uh, it was a too long, uh, uh, I say war even, although it is considered an operation, it is the third time that we are challenged by the Hamas, and I think it was uh, uh, time to uh, not destroy Hamas, because it's a political and religious movement, but at least to destroy its military capability. And I think that uh, Israel did not de- take this opportunity when there was quite a lot of uh, international support, and we had a very important uh, uh, key ally, it's the government of Egypt. And still, uh, we see that uh, Hamas has still military control of Gaza, and in my opinion, uh, they see their, uh, if you want, their uh, capabilities uh, for the future as a part, as a kind of challenge of, of Israel. And many people in Israel speak about another operation in two, three years, including the government, which is not sure that it is finished. So we'll see how the diplomatic and the political fight will be led by the government, and I hope that we'll have more. Uh, victories in this field than we had in the military field. It appears that in this round, this is the third round in the last uh, five years with Hamas, that they improved, they upgraded their capabilities from every standpoint, from the standpoint of psychological warfare, from the standpoint of uh, attack tunnel, uh, offensive warfare using tunnels, which of course uh, has been an ancient art. But uh, here we see uh, the Hamas had uh, had nearly um, completed preparations for a very far-reaching plan for, a, uh, I would say, a mega 9-11 attack, if you will, against Israeli cities. What's your, what's your assessment uh, of their use of attack tunnels uh, as a new offensive strategy? Um, it was a very uh, difficult fight for Israel, but finally, I think in this field, uh, Israel prevailed. Uh, I mean, there were three or four attacks. Uh, two of them uh, were s- successful, and uh, Israeli soldiers were killed there. But as a whole, this was a strategic weapon, and finally, even tactically, it didn't have a huge uh, impact on the fight. Uh, but uh, we must understand that at the same time, there's another network, a very huge network, which permitted them to subsist for so sem- sem- many uh, uh, days, 50 days, their leadership was not touched, political leadership, most of their military uh, leadership are still alive, and I think that uh, this uh, uh, challenge of the tunnels will be uh, again uh, felt in the future. One of the context, uh, the context of the tunnels is also uh, very troubling from a legal standpoint. Here we have uh, a situation which uh, Israel was uh, pulled in, if you will, uh, in a responsive operation into heavily into two heavily populated areas in the Gaza Strip, what kind of um, what kind of legal ramifications did that does that hold for Israel, uh, Dr. Daphna Richmond Barak, and how well did Israel hold up uh, from a, from a legal responsibility standpoint? Thank you, thank you, Dan, for for hosting us today, and to the radio. I, le- before I answer your question about the legal aspects of tunnel warfare, um, let me just react for a second to to what we talked about Please. about Operation Protective Edge, maybe more generally. Yeah. Um, first of all, I I, I want to just maybe add a, a note of uh, optimism uh, to what uh, uh, Dr. Kamon said. Uh, the first note is about the the success of Iron Dome. I think uh, if we had any doubt about the Iron Dome uh, ability to 
to protect Israeli uh, civilians uh, during Operation Pillar of Defense in 2012, the, 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 the defensive mechanism, defensive system that, that Israel has uh, developed really proved itself during this latest operation where we were targeted with many more rockets and Iron Dome was on constant use uh, uh, during a long, much longer period of time. Um, now, if we look at the uh, assessment of the operation in general, um, however, on this point, I do share uh, uh, Ellie's views in a sense that if we look at the end of the operation, what we realize is that Israel was still being targeted with many rockets per day. And that raises the question of whether we actually managed to diminish, let alone eliminate Hamas's military capabilities. And I think when we look at the end of the operation and the number of rockets that were still being fired at Israel by Hamas and other jihadist organization, then we wonder really what it is that we've done. And not just to touch upon the question of the tunnels which you brought up. Um, here, I think uh, we are a little bit misguided because I think the tunnels, uh, I think Hamas has not fully uh, yet comprehended how it can use these tunnels against us. I think they have they have developed some methods and tactics, which they've learned from the history, as you said, that it's been a, a tactic that's been used from time immemorial. But I think they're learning also what they can do with these tunnels. And I wouldn't be so sure that we have discovered all the tunnels or that even the ones that we thought we knew um, how do we know that they don't have different levels to them? How do we know that they don't have another ramification? Meaning I'm really pessimistic about Israel's ability to e have eliminated the tunnel threat and to be able to deal with it uh, in the future. Um, so, so regarding the legal aspects, I think there are many questions that are uh, being brought up by this question of tunnels, which Israel has, uh, has not had time to, to fully uh, reflect upon either. In addition to the strategic aspect. Let's, let's talk just for a moment uh, about intelligence. <clears throat> there has been one of the many debates over this uh, operation. Some are, some are calling it a war, uh, in, pra in, in practicality calling it a, a limited war. Uh, the longest military operation probably since the 73 war, if uh, we're, not, if we're uh, correct on that. The, is Lebanon, that or the Lebanon war also. Since the first, second, since the, since the, the second first, Lebanon second. war. Second. Yeah. Lebanon. No, I mean, the first, the first war one. was much longer. Was, yeah, it was longer. Well, yes. all in all, yeah. So yeah. one of the longer oh, yeah. military operations in recent history. And the, the question is that people, uh, I think, are mistaken when they talk about why didn't Israel know, why didn't Israel know about these tunnels? I mean, or, or they knew about them and the army didn't respond. They didn't understand that it was an underground city of terror uh, that housed... Uh, th hundreds, if not thousands, of families. The entire leadership fully refrigerated, computerized, reinforced, and the the answer that uh, that I've managed to to uh, provide on occasion is that Israel's point of reference when it spoke about Hamas tunnel terror were the tunnels over under Philadelphia under Philadelphia yeah. corridor and not the tunnels in uh, central northern Gaza. Now, What's I your think, sense, Ellie? I think that from the point of view of intelligence, there was very good intelligence about uh, attack tunnels, most of them, and the. Uh, uh, network, huge network of tunnels which exist under all the Gaza Strip. It's not only the attack tunnels. The problem is, I think, that uh, the uh, uh, military did not exactly understand the tactics uh, on the ground, underground, how it will happen. Uh, and uh, that's also the fact that uh, we didn't uh, initiate the operation. So we waited one week at least in order to enter on the ground. And this permitted all the leadership and the military leadership, I mean, uh, and the commanders to go underground. And we couldn't use the intelligence we had before in order to um, eliminate them. That's why one of the problems of this kind of operation, which went on waves. And it was predicted from the point of view of uh, uh, Hamas, which always uh, heard from the Israeli side, we don't want uh, to destroy the Hamas uh, uh, control of Gaza Strip. And this is one of the problems. I think that uh, the fact that uh, our government thinks that destroying Hamas means the jihadists and Salafis will take control is not true, because all the jihadist uh, groups uh, were uh, formed in Gaza Strip since uh, Hamas took control in 2006, 2007. So they are under the umbrella of Hamas, cooperating with Hamas. They will be destroyed together with Hamas. And there is a political uh, problem also, because if we want uh, negotiated and uh, uh, if you want st in stage negotiations with the Palestinian Authority that should have taken control of the uh, border and then little by little of, of all Gaza 
we need that Hamas military capabilities would be completely reduced uh, to minimum. Uh, their military capability does not permit the Palestinian Authority to retake control of Gaza like the Egyptians and the international community would like to do it. Well, there's also, as part of this larger debate, there are those that say, uh, on the one hand, Yaakov Amidro, our former national security advisor to Prime Minister Netanyahu, has made the argument that um, what they call uh, minimalist victory is a, it's a new military concept, as you probably know, in counterterrorism, uh, in fighting terror networks, is the only type of victory possible. The question I think we have to ask ourselves, the three of us here, is victory, as we understood it in the classic state-to-state sense, possible under, under current conditions opposite the Hamas? I think that's an excellent question that you're asking. I think this is uh, why it's so difficult after each war to determine whether we've won the war or not won the war. And so much of it, of this assessment, is actually linked to PR, um, you know, effort of each side to convey its own constituency, uh, let alone the world, that it has won this war in order to give confidence and in order to rebuild and in order to rearm. So, uh, so I think it, it, we cannot use the same concept. And and there have been writings about this, about how asymmetric warfare and and state to non-state warfare actually requires a complete reassessment about what it is that we mean by victory. But again, if we are going to face another operation uh, in just a few months or years, as has already been announced essentially to the Israeli public, then the question really, uh, uh, really is, so so have we achieved anything? And I think go, going back to the tunnel question, um, I think it's not just about knowing about the tunnels. And I think, yes, the intelligence aspect is very important. But even assuming that Israel really knew about the tunnels, dealing with tunnel warfare requires a, a very specific set of skills and tools that even if Israel had known about all these tunnels, which is a possibility, even assuming that, I don't think Israel had developed the skills and the tools that it needed to detect the tunnels, map the tunnels, eliminate the tunnels, the technological tools that are needed in order not to have to send every single time a soldier in a booby-trapped tunnel. And all of these things require a certain understanding of this particular aspect of warfare. And And just like Ellie said, I don't think the use of the tunnel as a very unique and distinct strategy of war and a strategic threat to Israel was fully understood, even if... Um, they had known about the tunnels. Uh, that that step hadn't been yet uh, uh, overcome. By the way, I don't ac- accept uh, the uh, concept that it is not possible to uh, uh, win in the w- war on terror. Uh, we had uh, uh, historical examples, for instance, in Sri Lanka, the Tamil LTTE, mm-hmm. which was a very strong organization with uh, hundreds of suicide bombers, uh, which were grown since the age of 10. They had um, military boats and airplanes with suicide bombers, and still they lost the, the war in Sri Lanka. The same with the Shining Path in Peru that controlled 50, 57% of the uh, territory of Peru, and they were defeated in the end. But, in but, the case, but, in the but, case but Eli, of Hamas... If I can interrupt you for yes. a second, the, 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 you're absolutely right about Sri Lanka, but Sri Lanka did something that Israel will never do and cannot do today which because of uh, international law and because Israel is a law-abiding state. In Sri Lanka, the Tamil Tigers were eliminated at the at a very, very high cost of civilian life. Essentially, uh, Everyone was killed, including the Tamil Tigers. And that's how the, the threat was eliminated. Not, not everything. I don't, not everybody. I think that there was a price, clearly, like we had in Gaza also, a price of civilian people no, killed. Not as much. But uh, LTT was a very, very efficient organization, and it was destroyed. Folks, and I think we can go closer to home. I'm sorry to interrupt. Just yes. to, just as an insert here, Israel won the, the War of Terror in the uh, West Bank, in the West Bank you know, exactly. in, uh, from 2000 to 2005. Exactly. Because uh, the Hamas, the, the problem with Hamas is that now it is... Is a, almost a state. They have long-range missiles. They have drones. They have even a kind of small navy or mm-hmm. uh, seals. So we don't fight only terrorism. We fight a small army underground. Okay. So uh, it is true that even if we occupy Gaza, they can use terrorism, the suicide bombers, but not more than that. And again, if we want a s- political solution, we have to destroy their military capability as a state or mini-state and permit the more moderates to take control. And then I think we can demilitarize. Uh, Gaza Strip. I, we don't uh, even hear about the militarization the last days because everybody understands that if uh, Hamas will continue to control Gaza, it will be very difficult to demilitarize it. Well, let me just uh, take the op- let me just take the uh, they call the devil's position for a second and say okay. this: the, the prime minister said, "Look, I had it. I had the option 
uh, and it was laid out uh, by uh, the Ramat Kal, by the chief of staff, Benny Gantz, he said, look, we can take over the Gaza Strip. We can spend six months, Ami Dror's, uh estimate was six months, Benny Gantz's uh, estimate was two years, to clean out the Gaza Strip completely, uh, reimpose a military administration. It would be, uh, I suppose, uh, Dr. Barak would uh, define a legal occupation, a, re- uh, a reinstating a legal occupation of Gaza, uh, collapsing the Hamas leadership, destroying all the storehouses, destroying all the manufacturing plants, sh- uh, um, a complete um, uh, uh, closure of the seas and the borders. Um, the question is how many Israeli, what Israel's appetite is or, or uh, resilience is to uh, 200 or 250 or 300 soldiers uh, dead over a 200 over a two-year period in order to achieve that, uh, uh, and whether the international pressure, which we saw in the prime minister's behavior and the cabinet's behavior, was an extraordinary. A, a tool in their diplomatic tool chest. If we <laughs> noticed, it was a multi-stage war that would upgrade every time Hamas would break a ceasefire in order to give them more self-perceived legitimacy. The question is, is in, in your view, uh, Dr. Carmon, what is the, pri- the price of retaking Gaza in order to collapse the Hamas leadership, destroy the terror infrastructure, and bring a moderate leadership, is it, is it uh, reasonable? Now, I never thought about uh, occupying all Gaza and uh, controlling it for two, two years. This is not possible. But if we destroyed a large part of its military leadership and most of its long-range arsenal, I think it would be much easier be for the Palestinian Authority, Abu Mazen, with the help of the uh, Egyptians, which actually can stop completely the uh, passing of anything, anybody or anything to the Gaza Strip together with us, this would permit the Palestinian uh, Authority to retake control. Uh, I don't think that it is necessary to occupy, and I don't think it's uh, not necessary, but it's not uh, productive for Israel to occupy all Gaza. But I think there were sufficient possibilities, from, I heard it from also other military specialists, to uh, destroy the main military assets of Hamas and some of its leadership, which actually builds its uh, uh, capability uh, on the field. When, you, when we talk about uh, taking control by moderate forces, are we talking about local leadership uh, in Gaza, or are you talking about uh, uh, escorting in, if you will, uh, members of the Fatah uh, Palestinian Authority leadership that, uh, from everything I know, would be, would be an impossibility? Now, I think it is possible. It will be a a stage-by-stage operation. Uh, I think that the Americans, the Jordanians, the Egyptians will support the building of new uh, battalions in order to send them to the Gaza Strip. Uh, And uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, if they are given the opportunity and they understand that they can achieve something uh, with Israel only if they uh, reconquer Gaza. Otherwise, there will not be any kind of agreement between Israel and uh, the Palestinians. If they don't control Gaza, if Gaza is not part of a Palestinian moderate state, nothing can uh, can happen. And I think with the help of, uh, as I said, the Egyptians, especially the Jordanians, the Palestinian Authority could do it. And already now, it is talked that they will control the borders, first of all. Uh, the problem is, I think, in the next weeks, we'll see how Israel will be uh, sufficiently uh, effective in the diplomatic negotiations to stand by its own uh, uh, its own uh, uh, challenges especially to demilitarization and also control of the money flow in order to reconstruct the huge uh, buildings uh, destroyed there huge amount of buildings and infrastructure destroyed there this will help perhaps uh, to weaken Hamas, and we know, by the way, there are a lot of uh, Fatah members in uh, Gaza Strip. We know that they put them in jail, they fired on them because they are afraid also of this popular uh, uh, possibility of a kind of uh, uh, reaction to what they produce to the civil population in Gaza. Mm -hmm. So your discussion about the civil population, about reconstruction, demilitarization, leads us, I I think, to a a very important mini point that has to be made here uh, in this uh, roundtable discussion, and that is that what we have witnessed with the uh, Hamas terror organization is an international legitimization of Hamas that climaxed in the United States offering its services to mediate a diplom- a ceasefire and a diplomatic agreement between one of America's strongest allies, state allies, the state of Israel, and an internationally recognized terror organization illegal in the United States and in the European Union. This is an extraordinary development where the, the, the West is actually recognizing de facto, if not de, de jure, and this I asked uh, mm-hmm. Dr. Barak, uh, uh, an international terrorist organization that uh, uh, Dr. Boaz Ganor has long called a hybrid terrorist organization, uh, 
uh, uh, they control territory. Uh, they're a they're a pre state actor, and here they have. In some sense, next to the Palestinian Authority, they're sometimes adversaries and sometimes colleagues, international legitimacy. What's your thinking? What's your thought? Um, I think you're pointing now to one of the great inconsistencies that uh, we are uh, demonstrating when dealing with an organization like Hamas. On one on one hand, we do call it a terrorist organization. It's been designated as such, as such by the United States for decades. Uh, and that's how Israel relates to it as well. At the same time, the reality is a little bit different because we are dealing with the elected uh, government, uh, which is actually governing its territory. Uh, whether we like the, the way in which it's doing so, that's a different question. But it is exercising control over the territory uh, and and it is recognized by the international community as part of a Palestinian state together with the West Bank. So um, is it a terrorist organization and a non-state actor or is it a, a, a state actor? And, um, and this question brings with it a whole flow of legal consequences. I won't get into too much of the details right now, but essentially what we had is, is legal tools that were meant to to help us uh, govern wars between states. We had to adapt all of this to a new situation where we were states were fighting non-state actors, right? That's the LTT, for example, or, uh, or other organizations around the world. But today, what we're dealing with when uh, in Iraq and in Syria increasingly, and in Israel with Hamas, and in Hezbollah, uh, in Lebanon with Hezbollah, is a whole range of actors that are becoming more sophisticated and are be uh, you know demonstrating or showing features that are much more the features of states or quasi states or mini states or hybrid actors and we haven't fully resolved that tension uh, we have to resolve it not only in our policy and in our strategy but also legally and i think that's actually one of the upcoming legal challenges and and, and legal questions that israel really should take on what do we do about that how do we address this actor how do we address for example the members of the organizations are they still uh, not are they still civilians taking a direct part in hostilities or are they actually combatants and do they deserve POW status just these are just kind of like um, uh, some questions that arise are these are these issues that the international legal community has to has to grapple with right I think away Israel has to grapple with them right away and uh, the and the, and the broader world, yes, at large, but immediately Israel for sure. I think that this is exactly the result of this kind of operation, because if beforehand you decide you don't want to destroy the Hamas government uh, and control of the Gaza Strip, you already give them mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, if you want, the authority to be a partner in the negotiations. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it took so many days, uh, it permitted the use of the, the destruction of the, the civil infrastructure and so many people killed to use this as a kind of tool against Israel on the international uh, arena. And we saw how many uh, Europeans, uh, Westerners, are attacking Israel today because uh, they are seeing only what happened on the Gaza Strip and don't consider what uh, the Israeli people suffered, but do, permitted them to do it for 50 days. If you finish this kind of operation in two, three weeks and you destroy the main uh, uh, Capacity, uh, military capacities of uh, Hamas, it will not be in the position to be a partner in the negotiations, in my opinion. Let's just, That's before we turn to the larger uh, Islamic terror network uh, uh, facing uh, the Middle East uh, and facing Israel on its northern border, let's just talk for a brief moment about psychological warfare, uh, cognitive warfare that the Hamas undertook this time. You know, in the world of counterterrorism, uh, we talk a lot about the battle for hearts and minds. And in general, um, the, the general meaning is that, that hard terrorism uh, also has a cognitive, uh, ha has an important cognitive role by virtue of, you know, the 9-11 effect, uh, attacking, knocking down the twin, the, uh, uh, the twins uh, on uh, a prime time at 8.45 in the morning when everyone's going to work and everybody's watching TV and listening to the radio. Here we have a situation of even the greater seriousness in which the Hamas involved uh, uh, and pursued soft terrorism uh, beyond to complement their, uh, their uh, hard terror operations. I got on my cell phone a number of times a, a text message from the Hamas leadership telling me that they were going to come uh, into uh, uh, Gush Etzion and kill my family and, uh, and kill me and uh, to be prepared for incoming Qassam rockets. Now, one of the reasons that you know they weren't serious is that a Qassam rocket fired from the Gaza Strip could never reach Gush Etzion. They need an M75 or another uh, mid-range rocket. But the very fact that they uh, obtained millions or several million text addresses 
email addresses, were writing in Hebrew, warning uh, warning of incoming rockets, and they made good on their promises uh, yeah. on a number of yeah. occasions. Yeah. This had this really seemed to have a, a, a substantial effect. I want to get your thinking on this too. The 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 use of psychological warfare netto, as they say, uh, by the Hamas. Moreover, they did not permit the journalists on the place to film any Hamas fighter. You didn't see any Hamas Only fighter. Civilians. Only, Only civilians. Only civilians, oh, and they all all the time permitted them, the, all the reporters there, to film the uh, hospitals, all the uh, tremendous scenes of uh, people, young people and uh, children which were killed. But at the same time, who was killing our soldiers? Who was firing on our territory? You never saw them. Never. Only now we see, at least still, not sufficient uh, testimonies of what happened there from their point of view. And this was a success from their point of view because we saw even journalists which went out of, uh, of uh, Gaza after several weeks, they were afraid to speak freely. You need to uh, speak with them and to convince them to give the, uh, the, the, the films or the videos or the testimonies that they have in order to, see, uh, to, to explain that the situation was completely different. On yes, only after five or six weeks did journalists from some of the major organizations such as Reuters and AP actually come out and, and admit that they were suckered and uh, or or mm-hmm. maybe they knew they were being suckered from the very beginning and they and they admitted to being intimidated uh, uh, and threatened uh, if they were to report on uh, the fact that that uh, Hamas installations were right next to hotels mm-hmm. where journalists were staying were reporting that, yeah. that's actually really interesting and uh, and I think that uh, Unlike other operations, uh, one thing that uh, that set this operation apart was that um, Israel actually was able, to some extent, to fill that void. Meaning, this uh, a vi- a visibly uh, deliberate strategy of Hamas not to show its fighters and to show only the civilian population, and, and even when you saw evacuations of people from civilian uh, building that were about to be uh, struck, then you saw only women and children. There were no men there or very old men. So in other words, it was clear that the men were somewhere else, but we never got these 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 pictures. So what I think was interesting in this operation is how Israel really tried to fill that void, that gap, and how it actually took upon itself to actually deliver this information. We got a lot more information, I feel, from the IDF uh, regarding the actions of Hamas, the kind of uses that were made of civilian tar- uh, uh, civilian buildings, about UNRWA schools, about ambulances, things that we've heard in the past, but this this in this particular operation, I think Israel did a lot more to actually show us where were the fighters, what were they doing, uh, and, and, and to give us essentially the information that Hamas itself was willfully not delivering to the world. So I think we, we improved on that on that side. Uh, so on that note, let's take a short car ride from the Gaza Strip northward and let's go to the Israeli side of the Israel-Syrian border. We could, if the three of us actually used our binoculars and looked over the border into Kenetra, uh, into Kenetra we would see the flag of, of al-Nusra, uh, the uh, al-Qaeda branch in Syria flying over uh, Kenetra. Uh, and it brings us to a larger point. To what to what extent are is Israel really under threat now by uh, Al Qaeda in uh, in in Syria and by Islamic State in the same states as well as Hezbollah in Lebanon? Are we looking at networks of jihad that uh, do not lend themselves to centralized state control and that create a whole new set? Of, um, of challenges for Israel that one can argue are even much more serious than the Hamas threat in Gaza because we, as we discussed a few minutes ago, at least they are perceived, if not, uh, if not uh, in f- they are in fact some sort of a central government in Gaza. But here now we're in the north, we're dealing with uh, networks of jihadis. Eli, how do we understand this? Uh, I don't think that for the moment uh, there is an uh, important uh, threat to our interests, uh, not from Syria and clearly not from uh, Iraq. Uh, I think that Lebanon uh, and uh, Jordan are much more threatened. But on the strategic level, if indeed they'll uh, control much of the Syrian territory uh, and they'll take control seriously, not only fighting with the uh, regime there, with the Bashar regime, or in Lebanon, uh, this can uh, have a direct impact on us. Uh, but if you look uh, to what the West and the United States are preparing now, they are building a coalition to fight the Islamic State in Iraq. Now they speak a bit also of the Syrian territory. But we have on our border, Jabhay al-Nusra. Jabhay al-Nusra is the direct uh, tool of or associate of Al-Qaeda. They uh, uh, are part of the Al-Qaeda of Ayman al-Zawahiri. 
and nobody is speaking about the fact mm -hmm. that they are taking prisoners, uh, the United Nations uh, forces, and they are not uh, under the, uh, if you want, the, the fire of the Americans or the Westerns. Uh, so you see, there is here, a and who is financing them, by the way, is the Qataris, because they succeed in liberating some of the prisoners, like uh, the last American uh, journalist, for instance, Curtis, mm -hmm. or some of the United Nations uh, uh, peacekeepers, because they are financing al-Nusra. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the same time, United States is continuing to cooperate with uh, uh, with uh, Qatar. We see, by the way, very interestingly, the Saudis. The Saudis said that send them uh, their uh, minister of defense, uh, minister of intelligence, head of the intelligence, to admonish. And they uh, don't have an ambassador in Qatar because they press Qatar to s uh, finish their support to the jihadists. And uh, this complex reality in the in the Middle East will continue, I think, for the next decade, and we'll see how the new coalitions will challenge this threat. Final word. We're going to have to cut off after yeah, this. Just a to, complex Middle East. To basically add one thing to to what Eli uh, I accurately uh, just uh, pictured. I don't think that the uh, Operation Protective Edge that just took place and arguably finished can be understood or even assessed. Um, without taking into account the broader context that Eli just described. Meaning, I don't think that what was going on in Iraq basically at the same time was um, completely disconnected and had no impact either on Hamas's behavior during Operation Protective Edge or on Israelis' reaction during Operation Protective Edge. So I would argue that the two are not at all uh, uh, this, uh, you know, are different. I mean, they are different, but there are complex relationships between the two. And to understand Operation Protective Edge, you need to look at this broader context. Broader context of the Middle East, Operation Protective Edge, what we call global terrorism, global and local terrorism. This concept and many other terms like these and many other ideas are going to be discussed at the upcoming World Summit on Counterterrorism, Terrorism's Global Impact, the 14th Annual International Conference put on by the International Institute for Counterterrorism. Right here at Herzliya, it'll be at the Daniel Hotel in Herzliya, Pituach, uh, from September the 8th through that infamous date, September 11th, this year, though, 2014. I'd like to thank our two very distinguished guests, Dr. Eli Carmon, senior researcher at the International Institute for Counterterrorism, and our very own Daphna Richmond Barak, the head of the law desk at the ICT. Thanks very much thank for you. being thank with you. us thank on you, this uh, compelling roundtable. Thank you to our listeners. You've been listening to IDC International Radio 106.2 on the FM dial. Please join us again for another counterterrorism roundtable very soon. IDC Radio 106.2 FM IDC Radio in collaboration with Kol Israel.